microphone. So um, anyway, we'll cut to the chase, basically. What I'd like to do this morning is kind of set the stage, hopefully, for a lot of the other conversations and presentations that you're going to hear over the course of the next two days. So I think this is a very powerful graph. It might be a little bit hard to conceptualize or see from the back of the room, but really what I'll do is cut to the chase and um, kind of say you know, what the bottom line is here. What this graph shows is time starts off here in 1980 and goes to about mid-century, 2050. And along the vertical axis, the up and down, is how much CO2 society emits. The black dots kind of show the path, so these are observations. So pretty much we're sitting right here. Somewhere around nine gigatons of carbon society emits into the atmosphere each year. And then if we want to go forward, basically the dotted line kind of sets the stage on where we are now. And each of these colored lines are, are what we call scenarios. What will future society look like? And I think the take home message is not really any one of these lines in particular, but the point that I want to make is if this is where we are today, very few of the lines fall below this dotted line. So basically as we move into the future, uh, we're looking at a society that emits a lot more carbon than they do today. Um, I'll point to this red line, which is pretty much the path that we're on. So if we follow this path out to mid-century, instead of emitting about nine gigatons of carbon per year, we're almost double that at about 18, okay? So society is poised to emit a lot more carbon. Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are poised to go uh, much higher. Uh, I'll make one allusion to this kind of blue line. Uh, this is what I would call a pie in the sky scenario. It's a, you know, basically none of the projections, social science, economically, things like that, say that we'll be emitting carbon at that rate at, at mid-century, but perhaps this is something to strive for. Um, also note, even in this scenario, we're not doing much better than we were doing, say, in the 1980s. Um, so basically, having said that, we're basically on the road to a world that looks like this. If we look globally, um, Kind of hard to see maybe the colors here, but notice they're all red and, and darker reds, particularly in the Arctic. We're in a world by mid-century that looks to be five, six, seven, eight degrees C warmer than it is today. So kind of at least, unfortunately, I'm going to go back and forth. Some of my slides have C and some of them have F, but if you work in degrees F, you know, round numbers double these. So I'm talking 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we've seen in the past. Um, on this side of the graph, notice there's still a lot of reds and yellows. This is if we choose that kind of what I called pie in the sky pathway, where we significantly reduce carbon emissions. Point that I want to make is these are still red. These are still temperatures that are warmer than we've experienced now. On the order of one, two, maybe in some places, three degrees C, six degrees F, warmer than we've experienced today. So the point here to take home from this is even if we drastically reduce our carbon emissions, we still have to worry about warmer temperatures. The Earth's climate system has lots and lots of inertia. You know, if we're driving a Mack truck down the interstate at 70 and we step on the brakes, we're still going to go a significant distance. We can use the same analogy here with, with the climate system. Um, I throw this graph up here because this is one of the graphics that kind of caught my attention as being a good communication point, it really made me say, oh my God, this is really, really, you know, a big deal when we talk about changes in temperature. And what I want to say here is that the blue are the observations of um, actually temperatures in central New York from about 18, early 18, or late 1800s to, eh, I'll call that present. And then the red and the yellow lines are if we continue to emit carbon at the high rate, we end up maybe here with the temperature, you know, oh, from this point to this point, about four or five degrees C warmer than we've seen. And here, this is a lower emission scenario in the, in the yellow. But the point that I want to make with this is notice this, hopefully you can see it from the back, this gray box. And what this gray box represents is kind of the range from the lowest temperature we've ever seen in the historical record to the highest temperature 
that we've ever seen in the historical record. And if we follow these red and yellow lines out to the future and kind of follow these two arrows, we reach a point in about 2050, 2060, where the coldest year we ever see in central New York here is warmer than the warmest year we've seen in the past. So we're clearly into a new regime where what we consider to be cold mid-century is basically the hottest year we experienced in a 100-year record. Yeah, I see a couple of you know, faces. That's, a, to me, an amazing statistic. And also, regardless on whether we go low or high, we kind of reach that point at the same level. And only after that does it get worse and worse and worse if we continue to emit carbon dioxide on the path that we're on. So anyway, get rid of that. Whoops. All right. And, and before I get into some data, the other point that I want to make is I get a lot of questions about, all right, wow, we've seen a lot of hail, or we've had a big drought, or there haven't been a lot of hurricanes. And is that due to climate change? And you know, maybe one of my pet peeves in it is that you know, anything, something unusual happens with the weather. There's a tendency to either use it to deny climate change, or to say, wow, this is due to climate change. So all right, you know, we've had a very cold winter in upstate New York the last couple of winters. Is that due to climate change or not? Well, maybe the, the point that I want to make is a lot of these things the jury is still out on. There's still a lot of basic scientific research that is going on. So in this graph, which actually um, this graph kind of evolved um, from a number of papers that appeared in the Bolton of the American Meteorological Society, um, what it attempts to say is, whoops, I didn't want to do that. What it attempts to say is basically two things. What is our scientific understanding of the cause of these different weather, or I might say extreme weather phenomena, along the So this is our scientific understanding of how increased greenhouse gases might affect these. Okay? And along the bottom is our ability to detect changes in these things. So the things that are up here, precipitation, heat waves, cold waves, to a certain extent, floods, okay, this is where we have good knowledge, good ability to be able to detect changes in these phenomena. And we also have good reason to know the, the fundamental underlying climate science on why increased greenhouse gases should affect these. So these are kind of the areas where we have high certainty on what might go on. In the middle of the graph is maybe where we have you know, a modest understanding. And down here is where you, know, you can flip the coin. Is climate change going to affect ice storms? I don't know. You know. There's not a good record of these. And ice storms occur under such a narrow band of meteorological conditions that it's hard to say whether an increase in greenhouse gases will do that in one spot or another. So kind of keep that in mind. And you know, things like tornadoes and hail, when we talk to the fruit industry, really care about hail a lot. Is, you know, is the increase in hail we've been seeing or perceived to be seeing, no, perceived less knowledge of the detection, is that something we can expect more of in the future? Hard to say. All right, so let's look back in time. Uh, this series of graphs comes out of the latest national climate assessment. Um, basically focused on the northeast region, and what I'm calling the northeast region is this little icon back down here, Maine to, um, Maine to West Virginia, kind of follows the USDA Ag Hub definition of the northeast, and also the, the NOAA Climate Center that I direct definition of the northeast. Point one I make here, seasonally is temperatures have increased in all seasons in this region. Um, each of these increases is uh, statistically significant. Um, in spring, fall, and summer, about a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit per decade. So over the last hundred years, about a degree Fahrenheit warmer. Um, but the winter here is winter, where we see basically more than double that increase. So over the last hundred years, our biggest change in the climate system, temperature-wise, in the Northeast, has been a, a significant and fairly remarkable increase in winter temperatures. Again, about two degrees over the last hundred years. Um, if we look at extremes, you know, like a day like today in upstate New York. Um, if we look at the data over the last hundred years for the Northeast, 
Um, do you see much there? No. All right. So the data show us not much of a trend in very hot days. Basically, a, a four-day average temperature of above 80 degrees. So you know, that's the metric that's been used in the national assessment, and not much of a trend. Very warm here in the early part of the century, and I would say kind of maybe a little blip up here in some warm decades here. Not much of a trend. Winter, though, cold extremes, a very significant downward trend. So four-day average temperature of two degrees, basically quite common back here in the early part of the 1900s and essentially unheard of here as we move into the 2000s. Frost-free season, about a, again, over the last 100 years, um, on the order of a week, a week and a half, 10 days of an increase in the frost-free season, the growing season. Total annual precipitation, also a significant increase annually. Basically, if we look at this, we're going from about, you now over the last 100 years, about a four to five inch increase in average precipitation. Kind of put that maybe into perspective, that's about a 10% increase in precipitation. Upstate New York gets about 40 inches of rain per year. Um, but where this really, um, at least in my mind, uh, becomes remarkable and where we have to take note it's the character of how this precipitation occurs. Okay. What we see is you know, a 10% increase in precipitation, big deal. But what we see is the way, how we get this precipitation um, has changed remarkably. It comes in a lot more big events. So this is essentially the number of, whoops, I'm going backwards again. Sorry about that. This is the frequency of roughly three inches of rainfall in a day. Um, Numbers are kind of small here because it's averaged over a large region, but the idea is this trend is basically a doubling of this figure. So when it rains, it pours is literally the message to take from this. And I think we've seen this time and time again over you know, the last several years. I mean, it's not unheard of in a summer to have somebody get four, five, six inches of rain um, even within central New York. And I think most of us have experienced it you know, this summer or last. Um, I'm going to kind of a, a different format of the graph, but where I want to bring in here with these graphs is humidity. So I know that's going to be a lot of the discussion over the next couple of days in terms of heat stress on cattle and livestock and things along those lines. So um, I think what you want to focus in on is this is temperature. This is a measure called dew point in this last graph is relative humidity. So I believe, um, I don't know, Kurt or Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, most of the, the livestock heat stress models use relative humidity as, as the measure of humidity. And the point here is that, yep, lots of red dots here for temperature, daytime, nighttime. So temperatures have been increasing across the country. Um, the dew point, a measure of how much moisture is actually in the, in the atmosphere. So in other words, if I had a bucket and thought of the atmosphere as a bucket, it's basically how many inches of water are in that bucket. Okay, so that's this middle graph. And again, the water has been going up in the bucket. But if I move here to this last curve, the relative humidity, Okay, that basically, again, if I use my bucket analogy, not only does the water, the level of water in the bucket changes, but the size of the bucket changes as time goes on. So it's relative, how much water relative to the size of the bucket. So is the bucket half full with three inches of water? It can also be half full with five inches of water if the bucket gets bigger. And the thing that makes the bucket get bigger is the temperature. And notice here we see a lot of blue. Okay, so over the last 50 years, I believe, in this graph, what has happened is the bucket has got bigger at a faster rate than the water has filled up in the bucket. So overall, the relative humidity has shown modest decreases, particularly in the eastern part of the United States. Um, and that um, sort of holds true in summer, except in the northeast, where we see a, a range of red dots up here, which says no, the water has filled up more than the bucket, and relative humidity has increased particularly during the daytime in the summer. Um, not the same here at nighttime, kind of some, some static, not much going on there. So everyone, that was kind of a quick explanation, but give me a nod of your head or something so I know that you're awake and, and have an idea you know what I'm talking about. Yes? Good? All right. Um, snow cover, winter snow cover. Basically, if we look across upstate New York, big red dots, 
basically 30 days less snow cover in winter, days with an inch of snow. Yeah, you might say, oh, that wasn't the case here over the last uh, couple of winters. Uh, again, anomalies, but the long-term trend over the last 30 or so years has been a remarkable decrease in winter snow cover. All right, so what does the future hold? Um, to do that, we have to ask a model. Okay, so wanted to make sure you guys were awake. You know, it's almost coffee break and times like that, and I equal opportunity here as well. So, um, all right. So, um, I, I think Pam is going to speak a, in a lot more detail about climate models this afternoon. But the way I'd like to preface this or kind of start off is, you know, basically I get a lot of questions about, oh, well, are climate models accurate? And there's, you know, what's the uncertainty in these things? And I, I'm going to try to bring this down to kind of a level hopefully where we can put it into our you know, kind of day-to-day -day experience. So what I did was I decided I was taking a trip from Rochester, New York to Washington. I went online and picked a number of kind of driving distance or driving time sites, you know, Google, MapQuest, whatever, and kind of in the ovals there in the circles, um, I said, how long, you know, I asked them, how long is it going to take me to get to Washington? And each of them gave me a different answer. I can't believe it. You know, some here said it was going to take me six hours and 18 minutes. Others said, I guess this was the other one, you know, seven hours and 14 minutes, an hour more. Okay. So a lot of uncertainty here, you know, an hour of slop. Okay. But yet we use these things every day to make decisions. Okay. So why? Well, basically these websites are really no different than a climate model. Yeah, maybe they're a little bit simplistic compared to a climate model, but basically they're based on an equation. They're based on physics. Time is equal to distance over speed. And a climate model, well, yeah, we won't go into that. <laughs> um, so why the difference? The drive time model and the climate model need to be parameterized. There are some things where I can't, I can't use physics to predict what's going on. So my example here, well, the drive time model, time is distance over speed. What's my speed? Well, if my mother did it, she'd do 55. If I did it, eh, I'd maybe do 75. My brother's a cop, so I kind of get a little leniency if I get pulled over or something like that. But anyway, I don't think anybody would argue that any one of these is right or wrong. Right? We've all driven those speeds, we've all seen other people drive those speeds, and it's just a matter of which one we choose. Okay? So if we look at climate models, there's, you know, there's probably 30, 40 different climate models, different climate modeling groups have different models. They all use the same base physics, but you know, maybe somebody says, well, that's a better average speed. Somebody else might say that's a different average speed. That's why they diverge. Okay? And my example here is maybe something like clouds in a climate model. How does a climate model replicate, you know, small little thunderstorms that might pop up that are smaller than the grid scale that might be there in the climate model, right? I might choose this as an average speed, but if I'm driving from Rochester to, to, um, to Washington, yeah, I'm going to hit a toll, you know, a toll. I'm going to maybe go through some towns and things like this. So this isn't always going to be the right speed to use. Um, again, things happen. In climate models, volcanoes go off. We don't know what year they go off in, but they're factored in. And on my trip to Washington, maybe I'm going to break down. I don't know which specific trip I'm going to break down on, but if I want to get that average time it takes me to get to Washington, I better factor in that one time out of 50 or 20 or 100, I'm going to break down. Um, spatial resolution. Work Climate models, global climate models, work on fairly large spatial scales. Each one of these red dots is the typical data point in a climate model. So if we look at the US, I don't know, I didn't count them, what, maybe 30, 40 at the best, data points for the United States. Um, if I use that and kind of map the coastline, that's what I get at the global scale. If I look at the topography, this is what I get. Yeah, maybe the rocky humps, but that's about it. Um, that doesn't work too well if I'm trying to predict what might be going on in a cornfield or a dairy farm or something like that in upstate New York. So typically what's done, and I'm assuming Pam is going to go into this a little bit more this afternoon, is downscaling. Go from that big scale down to the local scale. And as an example, I'm not going to go into the details, but here's maybe a downscaled climate model projection of the U.S. You know, better coastline, 
maybe still not quite everything in southern Florida. Notice this has the Great Lakes, and that really doesn't. It has maybe a, a blob there in where Wisconsin should be, and much better topography. Um, can downscale statistically and dynamically, and I'm going to leave it at that. Neither way is better. They're just different ways of doing the same thing, and again, an active area of research for going from that big global scale down to the local scale. And then finally, you know, there is a lot of areas where uncertainty can come into play. I use the drive time model, but basically at each step here, you know, what is our greenhouse gas emissions going to look like in 100 years? I don't know. You know, there's different scenarios, high, low, new technology comes in. You know, what do the models say, the downscaling? Um, you know, so this is all the climate part of it here, but then we have to look at the impact modeling, right? There's uncertainty in the impact modeling. How is that going to affect the corn or the cows or, or uh, whatever, whatever the, the model we're looking at? And then also, how does adaptation come into play? So... Um, the one point that I want to make with this idea of downscaling, and it's kind of a pet peeve, is basically small does not beat big. All right? So in other words, a lot of people say, boy, Art, if you can give me downscaled climate data at 100 meter resolution, all of my problems are solved. And basically my point there is, yeah, I can give you downscaled climate data or even observed data at 100 meter resolution, but basically all that's doing is kind of dicing things a little bit finer. So again, don't fall into the trap of saying, boy, the finer something is, the higher resolution something is, necessarily the better it is. All right, so what does the future hold? I do that in class and nobody knows what that reference is, so hopefully. <laughs> um, um, again, basically out of the uh, annual, uh, the national assessment, um, basically top row here is mid-century, 2040 to 2070. Bottom row here is the end of the, you know, 2070 to 2099. Um, in this case, A2 represents a high emission scenario. The emission scenario we're on now, basically there in A2, by the end of the century, by mid-century, double the CO2 we emit today. By the end of the century, quadruple the CO2 we emit today. B1 is a lower emission scenario. It's not that pie in the sky scenario that I spoke about, but basically what that scenario is, is we ramp up a little bit by mid-century and then by the end of the century, basically come out to where we are today. So kind of, you know, no better than we are today, no real reduction. And what do we see? Basically, either case by mid-century across the Northeast, again, here's my degrees F, we're basically around five degrees F warmer than we were back in the, in the late part of the 1900s. And then by the end of the century, if we go high emissions, the road we're on, we're looking at about 8 to 10 degrees F, warmer than we were. And if we choose that more middle of the road scenario, we're still about maybe 5 and 4 or 5 degrees F, warmer than we are today. So basically, we realize this difference in emissions more at the end of the century than we do uh, at mid-century. Warming occurs in all seasons, so this idea of just the warming occurring in the winter that we've seen in the observations really doesn't hold for the future, and really we see warming across the year and in both winter and summer in a fairly similar amount, high, low emissions, kind of at least these bars are pretty much the same in winter and summer. Um, if we look at some of the extremes, um, these are days with the uh, maximum temperature greater than 95. Again, I'll use it a day like today is probably an example of that. If we look historically, there are very few days above 95 in Ithaca's climate record. I don't know the exact number, but it's unusual for a year to have a day above 95 in Ithaca. I doubt we'll get it today. It'll be close. But the point is, as we move into uh, basically the mid-century uh, period of time, most of upstate New York is seeing about three to six of those days. And as we move further south in the region, um, kind of the Delmarva Peninsula, Maryland, uh, D.C. area, you know, they're looking at an increase in those kinds of days of about 20 more days. Okay? So 20 more days above 95 in Washington by the middle of the century. 
Um, that's, you know, that's almost a month of those days. Um, winter, here's where it kind of changes more drastically in, in the northern part of the region. These are days with a minimum temperature below 10 degrees F. Um, again, reds are decreases in those numbers. It's getting warmer. And if I look at maybe the Adirondacks or almost all of Vermont and New Hampshire, there's on the order of 30 less days, 25 less days, with a minimum temperature below 10 degrees. Um, even in the southern part of the region where those aren't all too common, um, basically it becomes unheard of to have a minimum temperature below, uh, below 10 F. Um, Freeze-free season increases by mid-century by about three weeks. Okay, so the growing season becomes three weeks longer. Would say that has a, a big impact um, on production agriculture in the state or in the region. We move to precipitation. How am I doing, Kurt? Good. Okay, oh, I'm doing really good then. We'll have time for questions. So if I look at precipitation, um, again, same type of graph as earlier. These are mid-century, these are late-century, high emissions, lower emissions. All of those graphs kind of look the same, okay? Kind of this bluish area around the order of about maybe a 5% increase in average rainfall. So that, you know, we saw about a 10% increase over the last 100 years. We should see a similar increase over the next 100 years. So that we might think of that as being good, right? We be, we're water rich. Um, but if I look, and I look at the seasonality of this, see kind of maybe a little bit different picture than before. Um, annual, so here's my 10% annual increase, 5 to 10% annual increase. Here's winter, here's summer. Most of this increase in precipitation is coming in the winter time. If I go to summer, you know, basically here's the zero line, the no change line, and, and these bars are small. And they're on either side of that line. And these kind of whiskers here are the uncertainty. Okay. So basically, it's, what it says is, yes, we get a lot more precipitation. But most of it comes in the wintertime. Most of it probably doesn't come as snow in the wintertime. It comes as rain in the wintertime. So a very different impact, a very different way of managing water, perhaps. And even though you might say, yeah, an increase in precipitation might be good, still have this pesky kind of pattern here in the summer where it could go either way or what I would like to say is the uncertainty, the variance that we get year from year to year, week to week to week in the summer becomes more pronounced. So the idea of, yes, more rainfall on average, but you know, drier periods in the summertime, periods where we don't get much rain, kind of a colleague of mine from Delaware, at least where they've been experiencing this maybe a little bit more than we have here, kind of calls it flash drought. You know, it's droughty, but only lasts three or four or five weeks, maybe not a water resource kind of impact, but definitely an ag impact, particularly in a place like the Delmarva Peninsula where the soils are sandy and things like that. Um, if we go to the extremes, okay, big rainfall events. These are a number of greater than one inch rainfall events, again, from the national assessment. Um, I guess maybe a little bit of a, a blurry graph here. Here's New York, there's Vermont, lots of dark colors here. Those dark colors, you know, about a 30% increase. So the frequency of these big rainfall events continues to increase, and the increase there is about 30%. So basically, if we expect you know, 10 of these one inch events in a year, we're gonna up that by another three in a year. Again, more common heavy rainfall events. Um, the other side of that is dry periods in the summertime. And again, out of the national assessment, some models, um, not much going on here in New York or New England. And basically what this says is the number of days, so basically this is a graph of the, if I take the summer, and I look at the period of time where there is, you know, the, the chunk of time where there's less than three millimeters of rainfall. I think I forget, do the math, what, about a tenth of an inch, I guess, right? So if I look at time period, you know, how long do I go before I get something more than a tenth of an inch? Um, and I look at the maximum period of that in the summertime. Um, that's what this graph is trying to show the change in. 
And across upstate New York, the kind of the brown areas, you know, maybe that period, that maximum period, changes by a day or two. In other places, like up here in the Adirondacks or in the northern Vermont, actually that period decreases. So that's a good thing, right? Less the dry periods are less. So I move further and further and further south, the graph becomes darker and darker and darker. These dry periods in summer start to increase and increase and increase. And again, if we factor in soils and things like that, we get a, a much bigger problem in, in places like, like the Damarba. All right, so that's kind of where I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so obviously the climate is changing. Um, we've got to do something about it. And dialogues, conferences like this are hopefully a way to uh, start to initiate that discussion. So I assume I have time for questions. <laughs>